Thanks everybody for joining. Uh, you're in Barracuda, Avis, and Securosis, Application Security for the Cloud. Uh, Nick Matthews, I'm a Swiss director for AWS. Uh, now before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, one is when you joined, you had the option to come in over audio or over uh, your phone. You can switch that in your, your panel there on the right. Uh, as well, the slides for this will be available after this webinar ends, uh, so check your email for the link to that. In addition, uh, this whole thing's going to work a lot better if, if it's a little more interactive. We have some questions. So uh, you have the ability to, to ask questions in the, the panel over to your right. So we uh, highly encourage you to use that feature. Uh, so, you know, getting started, uh, what we're really going to be here to talk about is, is, is really Barracuda and sort of security on the cloud. So um, we're also joined by Rich Mogul, uh, who's an analyst and CEO of Securiosis, and Tushar Richabadis. Uh, who's the, the product manager for Barracuda. All right. So what we're really going to talk about today is uh, I'm going to give a, a real brief intro um, on sort of some of the core topics that are uh, topical for today. And then uh, and then we're going to really talk about sort of like security on the cloud, which is, you know, uh, part of the, the core concept of this is, is automation as well as what Barracuda provides on AWS. So if we actually get into security on AWS, it's a really core topic that um, deserves a bit of thought, right? So for AWS, uh, it's job zero for us. And we, we say this for repeatedly if you've been to reInvent some of our other um, sort of customer facing events. Uh, but I mean, it's, you know, it's one of our customers' biggest concerns. Uh, and so we spend a enormous amount of time and effort on this. Um, it, it's what we really, really focus on. And there is nothing that, that is secondary to security for us. Um, you know, for, for folks that are on-premises, you know, it's sometimes uh, a bit uh, different to, to work in AWS, um, and, and that's okay. So the, a lot of the things that still happen on-premises, so the, your data center security, your um, compliance management, the auditing, uh, pen testing, and a lot of the stuff that happens sort of uh, at a normal security level, well, AWS handles all that for you, right? Uh, another component that we're seeing on AWS is that um, people are, are raising the bar on what they expect in the cloud. So from a, a security perspective, you know, people are actually saying, you know, my on-premises environment is, you know, secure enough. But when I, when I move to AWS or I move to the cloud, I'm actually expecting more security. Uh, and that's a big trend that we're seeing. Uh, as well, um, one of the big sort of changes that we're seeing is, uh, for instance, uh, Capital One, C, or their CIO, said that they can operate more securely in AWS than they can on-premises. Uh, so we're actually seeing sort of a, you know, a couple years ago when I was talking to customers, you know, it was all about, you know, like, is AWS secure? And, uh, is it possible? Uh, and now, actually, the, the conversation is sort of changing to, like, if on my AWS, is it, is it more secure? So what this comes down to for, for us is the shared security model. Uh, again, this is a very common slide that we've presented a number of different times. Uh, so the, the basic sort of story here is that uh, AWS takes care of the security of the cloud. So the infrastructure, the data centers, the computing, the hypervisor, uh, the sort of core components that build up our uh, infrastructure services. Well, we, we secure that portion of the cloud. Um, the, the top part is the security on the cloud. So basically everything that you configure on AWS um, is sort of your responsibility. So for example, you can build uh, PCI compliant applications on AWS, but just because you build it on AWS doesn't make it PCI compliant, right? So you have, you're, as a customer, responsible for your configuration, your data, uh, your encryption, your network security, right? Which is uh, part of what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, that is, that is your responsibility, and this this goes a couple different ways. Like I said, uh, initially some customers were talking about like, okay, well AWS isn't secure enough for me. I I need some more sort of assurance that they are secure. Uh, I think we've gotten over that hump with uh, a large, large majority of customers. And now it's actually sometimes this, this actually end up, ends up being a tool for us to help customers say like, look, just because you're on it, that doesn't actually make you secure. Uh, you do actually need to go through and take some additional measures to make sure that, that you know, you're taking full sort of ownership of your data, your compliance, and, and other components on AWS. Uh, and then just quickly, another sort of component uh, in terms of how you're more secure on AWS is, is really around automation. You know, our um, our security organization is entirely around getting people out of things. Right? If you go and look at what causes 
uh, outages and service disruptions and what causes security incidents, a lot of times it comes down to people touching things the wrong way. And so, um, you know, as AWS is built on entirely an API-based infrastructure, uh, it's, you know, sort of really ripe for automation. And we we strongly believe in, in automation. Um, so, you know, you may have heard of, uh, you know, the DevOps, which is this whole concept of uh, basically automating and creating a culture of moving quickly. Um, and there's this newer sort of term, uh, DevSecOps, which basically is the concept of getting security involved, like into your application development process. So, for instance, it means, you know, uh, if if your developers are writing, you know, HTTP code, making sure that something like cross-site scripting is not there when the code's written, as opposed to doing a, you know, vulnerability assessment, you know, months and months later. So it's 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 a very important concept for AWS because as you bring your resources on AWS, you want to make sure that you're using the same product, but sometimes that creates operational challenges. So you want to make sure that you're automating. You're keeping up with the pace of APS because one of the, the primary benefits is the pace of innovation and the automation you can do. So uh, I think this is really important, and we've got Rich here um, who can sort of expand on this a little further. Thank you, and for the next 20 minutes or so, what I want to do is focus on some of the specifics around the new kinds of things that you can do moving into the cloud, and particularly Amazon, because this is an Amazon-focused talk today, uh, and gain those security benefits that are in my mind, better than what you can do with your traditional infrastructure. Uh, so I'm going to walk through some slides. I'm going to show you a demo so that you've got a good sense of what this uh, looks like. Now, as we were just talking about, so I don't work for Amazon. I've never been paid by Amazon. I send Amazon a whole lot of money, um, and I work with all, you know, or work on a lot of the cloud platforms. And over the, the past eight or nine years or so that I've been working with these, I've really learned that I think these can fundamentally be more secure than most people's data centers. It's just the economics are in your favor. You have to, if something bad happens in your environment, it'll come out of some you know, incident response budget or something along those lines. But for the cloud providers, the providers know that if they're not secure, they're not gonna get your business. And so what we have seen is cloud providers, uh, particularly the infrastructure as a service cloud providers, software as a service is a bit of the wild west still, have put tremendous effort into building trust with clients because they're asking us to do something pretty extreme. Give up your data centers, give up control, main control of our physical servers, move everything up into a shared environment. Uh, and we need to be assured that when we move our data up there, when we move our assets up there, that those are going to still be secure. So a major breach for a big cloud provider, that's like game ending for them. They can't have too many of those. Uh, where we can kind of suffer breaches all the time, I hate to say it, uh, and keep trugging along in business because that's not the core trust value of most of our businesses. And so that's why it's such a top priority. Now, because of that, we have this really secure baseline uh, that we can build on top of. And we have all sorts of new automation, orchestration kinds of capabilities that we can take advantage of. And the real benefits we get with web application security in the cloud is when we embrace these changes and look at automating the security itself. Because in our normal environment, security tools and even testing are usually after the fact it's because security and development and operations are all these different teams. Uh, and development operations just hate it when our security tools slow them down. Firewall rule changes, uh, agents that affect performance or break things on a box, you know, even if it's a legitimate security issue and they recognize that, it's so, you know, their job is to get stuff up and running as quickly as possible, and our job is to keep it as safe as possible, and sometimes those things conflict over time. But if we look at actually the opportunities as we move into cloud, and particularly if we adopt the DevOps techniques, uh, we have, you know, incredible ability to combine those in ways to give us things like immutable infrastructure that I'm going to talk about, and really allow us to enhance our security automation integration. And so I'm going to talk about this in kind of a general sense. Shard's going to come on later. He's actually going to show you how to do some of this specifically uh, with web application firewalls and the Barracuda stuff. And where I always like to start in this conversation is around how cloud enables better segregation and isolation to allow us to control the blast radius of attacks. So if somebody gets in, which it does happen on occasion, or if something bad happens, you know, what's the scope of how much that's going to affect our organization or affect the rest of our application stack? 
and, and there's something that we really know and understand in the security world. We know how critical segregation is, and that's why we came up with BMZs and we internally compartmentalize our environments. But it's really hard to do it in traditional environments at both network level as well as the application stack level, which is something that we don't always think about. Uh, first, there's all the costs of trying to isolate all the network stuff. And then within our web application stack, you know, we need to maximize the use of our hardware that we have in our data centers because nobody, none of us have infinite budgets out there. And to do that, we end up having to run multiple application components very frequently on the same hardware. So if somebody gets into a box, you know, they, first they can move up and down the application stack on that box, and then they can move, you know, left and right, north, south, east, west, all through our environment on the network pieces of it. But this isn't actually true for cloud. We, at least if you adopt cloud properly, because what we can do in cloud is we have a tremendous ability to limit the blast radius. First, it's by default on the network. We have these things called security groups. Every single server, every single instance, for example, that we run in Amazon is protected against every other instance. I mean, every other instance, like even if they're in the same security group and the same subnet, they still can't talk to each other unless you open up rules. We have all this default deny stuff going on. What if somebody does compromise the whole network, which is like you would have to make tons of mistakes for something like that to happen. Well, even if they do that, they can't get to the next virtual network. When you're using Amazon, you don't pay money for virtual networks. You just pay money for the things using the virtual networks and the amount of data going in and out of your virtual network to the internet. So there's no additional cost. So you can stand up as many virtual networks, entire networks, class B networks as you want. Literally a couple of API calls takes a few seconds to run. And all of those things are isolated. And then even if they get in to your entire account, you can run as many accounts as you want and you don't pay for anything except for what's running inside of those accounts. So this really gives us a, a granular way to control that blast radius. And so for web applications, I typically recommend a minimum of three to five accounts per application stack. Uh, one for development, one for testing, one for production, different degrees of controls around each of those. And they don't have to talk to each other. And there's all sorts of tricks and stuff to get your data moving around and everything else. And it really allows you to kind of isolate uh, issues. So somebody doesn't have a test server running someplace, somebody gets into that, they can compromise production. That becomes nearly impossible unless you make just huge mistakes. But this kind of environment, this kind of setup, only works with automation and infrastructure as code. Uh, and this concept of immutable. And what do we mean by that? Well, the idea is if we define all of our infrastructure as code and our application stack as code and our servers as code or our instances, uh, we have the ability to use automation tools to update those or completely replace them as we need to. And what that means is everything's defined, everything's in templates, everything's in these files. And it runs through the automation process so that your production environments always look exactly as you have defined in that code, in those, uh, in those descriptions. And again, it's super powerful. We use continuous integration tools to do this. Uh, it gives us this super powerful ability to be able to be what I like to use the word deterministic. I can define my environment and now I have a way of enforcing that my environment meets the definition. So a little bit of how this works. We have on the left side of the slide here, you have your source code in a version control repository. So that's your application code. We have our cloud formation template. That defines the actual infrastructure stack in Amazon, your virtual networks, your instances, your identity management, uh, the, all the other pieces that you might be using, your load balancers within Amazon. That's actually a text file. I'm gonna show you one in a moment. Uh, and then we have our server definitions. In this case, it's Chef, it could be Puppet, Ansible, Salt Stack, whichever tool you wanna use. And it's another text file that describes the configuration of all those instances. Or if you're using containers, you would use a Docker file in that case. All of that's in a version control repository. And if you make a change to those, Jenkins, in this case, is our continuous integration server, that detects that change, spins up, if needed, an entire new testing environment, runs a suite of automated tests, and if it passes those tests, it might hand it off for manual acceptance testing or review, uh, or it might automatically push it into production. It's your call on how you want to go ahead and do that. Uh, and then it will overwrite anything in production with whatever changes were made on the back end. This is the power of DevOps. Development, security, because you embed your security controls in here, such as uh, Tushar is going to show you how to do that for the web app firewalls, um, and, your, and your application code, 
all use the exact same process, all use the same pipeline, and all are deterministic. If you change it on one end, it will overwrite the side on the production. And what is interesting about that is that, and as I'm talking, by the way, this is an example of a simple cloud formation template defining the network uh, infrastructure, network stack, is if you make a change on the left side and it's going to go ahead and overwrite the right side, you never make changes on the right side. Because if somebody goes in and makes a manual change to a production environment, which is where we often have our security flaws introduced uh, due to those manual changes, that's going to get overwritten the next time somebody changes anything on the left side, anything in those source definition files. And so we fundamentally change our process. Uh, it's super auditable, it's super secure, and we can even use it not just to update like an individual server, which is what I'm going to demonstrate in a minute, but we can use it to update our entire infrastructure. Because we can go ahead, we can take that cloud formation template for our application stack, we can actually define our updated version of our application stack, and maybe we're not totally sure if it's going to work, so we can actually run it in parallel with the old one, literally running two data centers side by side. Of course, they're all virtual, they're all up in the cloud, they're up in Amazon in this case. Uh, and then once we know everything is working on the new one, we can fully cut over to the new one, uh, and then we uh, no longer need to use the old one. Of course, we can revert to it if we need to, uh, because it's still in those source definition files. The first advantage we have is with cloud, we have this ability to control the blast radius because we can stand up as many of these environments as we want. We can isolate them from, under, from each other. However, to make that really manageable, we need to use this concept of infrastructure as code. We need to be able to write the definitions for what those environments look like because it's too much to maintain them manually. And we need to have automation tools and processes to take those definitions and actually put them into action to make them um, to make them actually usable and take place. And that gives us the ability to update environments or completely replace them. And because we have that ability, those environments become immutable because we no longer, uh, and I'm going to demonstrate this for instance in a second, the concept of immutable, we talked about it at the infrastructure level, define an entire application stack. Another way we can use that is also when we are uh, updating and running our servers and our instances. So in this case, we have a load balancer. It's going to be an elastic load balancer in Amazon and an auto scale group. And what an auto scale group does is it expands or contracts the number of running instances uh, based on demand and based on rules you set. But the other thing is, is if that some of those things become unhealthy for whatever reason, uh, the auto scale group will go ahead and replace those. So if some of them go unhealthy. They go offline. The auto scale group knows we need to meet a certain level of demand. Let's replace them. And it's all based on one of those configurations. Well, it's a great way to also patch running application components because we have our auto scale group uh, and we can actually manually take out unpatched things and then they will automatically and gracefully without downtime be replaced with patched things. We can also use this to insert our security tools. So again, what Tushar is going to demo is, is it, you expand or contract the demands on your environment, you can actually use that same tool to increase or decrease the web application firewalls uh, so that you get the appropriate level of protection for the servers running behind it. And then things can get also really interesting because you can actually use your architecture and automation techniques to create things like virtual air gaps. So that load balancer, it's something in Amazon. I mean, I assume it runs on a server someplace, but it's not a server that you manage or run. If Amazon it guarantees that they will keep that secure for you. And so you only need to worry about your web server sitting behind that load balancer, that ELB. So Amazon takes care of the security of the load balancer. You worry about the security of your web servers behind the load balancer. Uh, there's all the auto scaling that will occur in place. And then that's also an opportunity potentially for you to go ahead uh, and insert your uh, security tools uh, in between them. So a lot of talk, what does some of this automation and stuff look like? So at this point, uh, I'm going to take just a moment for control to be transferred over to me so that I can show my screen. All right, and then there we go. So I'm going to go ahead and show my screen. So this is an actual running Jenkins server here. And I'm going to go, uh, this is one I actually use for, for real work. So I um, use this to create, uh, run a lot of automation. Uh, and in this case, I'm going to go in and this is just uh, building up our web servers. So 
Uh, that's why it has the name website. So if I go in, you can see that it pulls things automatically out of Git. In this case, I'm using code commit, which is Amazon's hosted Git repository. Uh, it checks for changes every minute. And then it runs, uses tools called Packer and Ansible to go ahead and create an image on the other side. And I'll show you what all of that looks like in a minute. Um, what's interesting, though, in my case is I've also gone ahead, and there's a bunch of weird code at the bottom I'm not going to zoom into. Uh, I've actually automated, automatically integrated some security tools. And it's going to run a very basic test uh, because this I use a lot for demos, and it has to meet certain uh, Amazon requirements for, you know, I can't run a full vulnerability assessment without permission because they don't know if that's an attack or not. And if I scroll all the way down to my Jenkins, so it's creating all these things, you'll see right around here, uh, I'm running a tool called Gauntlet. And Gauntlet actually uses, it's kind of a broker for running security testing. And in this case, it runs an Nmap test to determine if port 22 is open on my instance. And remember, immutable, there's no reason to go ahead and log into an instance because it's just going to be overwritten by the autoscale group. So I might disable remote access so that nobody can log into that anyway. Uh, and it's an incredible security capability that we get for our application stack. In my case, I also made sure 4567 is open because that's what my little service is running on. So how quickly can this run and kind of do the rolling updates? Well, here's a little bit of a video demo. and Let me zoom this one in a little so people can get a, a better view of it. Uh, the demonstration I did at the RSA conference, uh, I think about two years ago, I updated 30 instances in, I think it was about four minutes. So there's my code running. In this case, you see all of the unpatched servers in my autoscale group uh, as they're read. And I'm going to fast forward a little bit for time's sake. And I made a change in Jenkins, and then it automatically starts running patching these. So it was about 30 instances, and it took about seven minutes for all of these instances to go ahead and run. And that's actually, this video is the older version of my code. Uh, the newer version is much more efficient. And it did this without any downtime. So I'm actually connected to those servers at the same time that they're updating to show, um, to show that capability. So that's it for my real quick demo. Let's drop back to the slides, and I'll finish up. And again, go ahead and ask uh, any questions here. Uh, and as they come up, we'll go ahead and get to those uh, either after our individual segments or at the end. And there we go. So that's a quick demo. And what I showed here was how to actually use Immutable, how to use uh, automation. In my case, the environment we had was an autoscale group with instances just behind a simple load balancer. I did not have a web app firewall in place uh, in my demo because I'm trying to show kind of the immutable and the automation sides of it. Tushar is going to go show ahead and show that uh, where he's going to take something very similar but insert the Barracuda lab using uh, pretty much the exact same automation techniques. So it'll look a little bit different, but it's the same conceptual techniques. And in my case, if I made a change on the left side here with my Git repository, my Jenkins picks that up. It automatically builds my server image, runs security tests on it, and if it passes all of those tests, goes ahead and it automatically rolls it out into production. You might want a more manual process. So the part that I just demoed isn't the entire application stack. It's just the web server piece of the application stack. But hopefully now you have a better sense of how all of these pieces can kind of tie together uh, and how you can use the exact same automation techniques. And to be honest, the same ones that your web application teams are using for the actually building and running their stuff in the cloud, you can insert your security controls. You can automate security testing. Uh, if you design things properly, you can really minimize your blast radius. Uh, you actually gain advantages as well because you only pay for like to compute your instances of what's running. So you can actually split up your application components more efficiently. And that was something I meant to talk about before and I, I kind of missed that on my slide, which is, uh, you don't have to use the hardware as efficiently as possible. That's Amazon's job, not yours. So you can actually break your applications down into smaller components so you can more better right-size the security around each of those components. And then I talked about infrastructure as code, and I showed you what a little bit of that looked like to define your entire application stack. And then I did a demo of just updating one portion of that stack, which is the, the web servers itself. Uh, and Tushar, again, is going to show you how to actually insert your security appliances between the load balancers and the um, uh, and your web servers to get that additional application security. So look, cloud providers have a massive incentive to be more secure than we are. Uh, and again, we see mostly in infrastructure as a service, not so much as SaaS. 
cloud, there's a lot more than running instances and virtual machines. There's platforms and service things like the elastic load balancers. There's all sorts of other things we didn't talk about. But to get those benefits, you kind of have to rethink your architectures. You have to not think in terms of like a DMZ or anything more. And you have to adopt these automation techniques because that allows you to insert and automate your security so they can keep up with the pace of cloud. Tools that aren't designed to do that aren't going to work. Things that aren't designed to work with automation are just going to hold you back, break the cloud environment, and then we know as security what happens to us when we do that. Uh, and so we really have this amazing ability. We can control our blast radius. We have these deterministic environments. We can lock things down using immutable so that nobody actually makes changes in production. It all runs through automated testing. Um, and to me, this is just all a security dream. So uh, that's the end of my section. At this point, I'm going to hand it over to, to Shar. Uh, from Barracuda. He's going to show the pieces of it that I didn't show, which is actually updating other parts of the infrastructure. All right. Thank you, Rich. Uh, hello, folks. My name is Tushar. Uh, I'm the PM for the Barracuda WAF in the public cloud. Now, uh, which talk is very interesting to us at Barracuda, and especially to me, because this ties in quite a bit to what we hear from our customers, what we see from analysts in the field, and more. So if you look at our current CI CD environments, you see that app security and app delivery are now closer to the applications than ever before. You deploy them right next to the applications. They are more application specific. They are not abstracted away from the application somewhere else. But typically, when you see that these two parts actually block the move from uh, a manual deployment to a continuous deployment by needing manual uh, intervention. It's something we've seen Gartner talk about also. They talk about how only 20% of DevOps shops have fully automated and moved to DevSecOps. And this is something that Rich has observed as well. Uh, if you've seen the part where uh, very often DevOps teams think that security slows them down. Now, with the Barracuda WAF, we've seen that with customers, uh, uh, Barracuda WAF serves to bridge the app security and delivery gaps. It moves customers from DevOps to DevSecOps. It fits very closely in a continuous deployment model. Where if you want to do something like what Rich demonstrated about up, uh, upgrading your uh, applications and performing a canary rollout, you can do that very easily with the Barracuda WAF. Uh, we'll now see a quick demo um, with uh, the Barracuda WAF, how we deploy it with a cloud formation template, how it integrates very closely with your application, and followed by a real world use case about how this automation works and solves problems for customers. Uh, we'll now see the video. All right. So this is the pay-as-you-go page of the WAF on AWS. You can deploy from here either as a single army or an auto-scaling cluster. Uh, when you go down to the cloud formation template and click view, you can see an entire topology of how the WAF gets deployed. And uh, also it shows you the actual cloud formation template to download. Now, the topology has the WAF in an auto-scaling group between two ELBs. Uh, this is called an ELB sandwich deployment. Uh, this enables maximum flexibility because this means that your application can auto-scale independently of the Barracuda WAF. Uh, each app, you can have multiple apps behind multiple load balancers. You can have uh, one deployment behind one load balancer and the same app with an upgraded deployment behind the other load balancer. Now, when you download the cloud formation stack, it's quite simple to use it. You can use it either via the cloud formation console, as I will show you now, or using any kind of automation, automation method, methodology um, or tool chain. Now, we'll just see this with the cloud formation uh, console. Uh, we've made the template as easy to use as possible. Uh, this uh, template will insert the Barracuda WAF into an existing VPC between an ELB sandwich, one external ELB that drives traffic to the WAF, and the other which drives traffic from the WAF to the actual application. The ELB that is being uh, configured now is the external ELB, uh, which will actually uh, load balance traffic between the various uh, uh, WAFs as they auto scale. Um, these are some standard inputs. And now you see the service configuration. The service configuration on the WAF uh, essentially means the application on the WAF, uh, as it is configured, you give it a standard service name, decide the port on which it will receive traffic. And you can specify either a server IP, if you have a single server in your test setup, or an SQDL. 
the FQDN can be the ELB's FQDN. We will continually resolve the ELB's IP and distribute traffic across the applications. Uh, with this, you can create the server port, which is typically port 80, and next. A standard tag, which we create to ensure the resources are toned down. And this is a quick review of uh, all that we created. You will see that we request an IAM role. Uh, the IAM role, oh, I'm going a little too fast, but this is a quick review of all the resources we are using. Uh, and an IAM role that we create to control access to a specific S3 bucket. This S3 bucket contains some deployment specific information that allows the VAP to auto scale and cluster with each other. Now that we hit, now we hit create. Uh, it takes a little while to create the stack. We'll fast forward through that. And we'll take a look at some of the resources that this would create. We have to start with uh, the alarms that allow the WAF uh, auto scale group to scale up and scale, scale down. Then we have the actual auto scale group and the launch config. Going into the auto scale group, we launched just a single WAF, so we'll go and look at the WAF right now. Uh, yes, this is the auto scale group. And now we'll go to the instances tab. One instance would have launched like we've asked it to. Uh, this instance, by the way, is going to be pre-configured with the application, the service that you saw earlier. It's very, it's actually very simple to log into the application, go to log into the WAF as such. You go to the uh, public IP of the WAF, uh, navigate via web browser. We have a very easy to use web user interface. Uh, typically, the WAF takes a few minutes to boot up, and once it's up, log in with admin and instance ID as password. Uh, once you've logged in, you will see two things. The first will be the dashboard on the WAF, which shows you a very good view of everything that the WAF uh, provides. Um, everything that the WAF uh, sees and the actual performance statistics of the WAF. And you will also see the service that is already being pre-configured on the WAF. This is a service that is going to uh, protect and load balance traffic across your actual applic applications. Now, to we quickly look at the vulnerable application as it is when we go through the WAF, just to see that we can actually navigate through the WAF. The, there is no latency introduced by the WAF, very minimal latency IA. And if you look at the access logs, you will see that we've actually gone through the WAF. Very nice. So we've now just shown you that you can automatically de de deploy the WAF. You can very easily bootstrap the WAF with the application config. And just for the sake of showing you, this is the S3 bucket that we created that we asked the IAM role for. Uh, go in there and it's a simple IP and serial number so that other WAFs can actually cluster with this. Uh, what happens when autoscaling happens uh, is an instance is autoscaled up, is that it looks at this IP clusters with the existing WAF, gets the latest and greatest config, and your application is protected all the time. Uh, back to the slides, please. So we'll now look at a very real-world use case where a large financial institution chose the Barracuda WAF to successfully uh, protect their AWS deployments. Uh, this uh, large institution had a few very specific challenges. They have a central infosec team uh, who distributes all the uh, base configs for security across all lines of businesses. Now, this team builds a base, decides on what security config has to happen, and this pushes it to all the very specific lines of businesses. They customize on top of it. They cannot really change it. And the thing when you do this is uh, each LOB has their own specific tool chain that they use for testing, for development, and for deployment. And to top all of this, they needed completely automated deployments across the board. Uh, and we'll see now how the Balkanov app actually helped them. The customer actually went and tried a whole load of uh, WAFs that are available in the marketplace. They did uh, exhaustive tests and then finally found their solution with the Balcura WAF. And we asked them 
uh, what we did best and they had three very specific challenges that we solved for them. The first one is our neonative integration with AWS was very effective. The ease of deployment combined with the ease of use solved a huge challenge. Completely automated deployments are possible with the Barracuda WAF. Uh, next, we covered pretty much all of their top level AppSec risks that their security analysts had come up with over and above the OWASP top 10. They found that we can even protect their JSON based API applications with the JSON firewall on the WAF. And in terms of cost controls, uh, the thing that finally clinched the deal, we were the most cost effective solution that did all of these things. Uh, we, offered usage, we offer usage based billing. And this moves away from the front-loaded cost of BYOL, the CapEx-based model that we don't like. Uh, and the per instance, per hour cost of pay as you go. Uh, with our solution, they only pay for as much as they use. They don't really uh, have to pay anything more than the traffic that is protected. We'll now take a very quick look at the architecture with the deployment chain. Uh, as you can see, uh, Everything is completely automated. No one does anything manually. Uh, everything from the developer configuring the WAF for his new environment to the QA guy, everything is automated, including the, the promotion process. And if you look at the model that Rich showed you and the video, the demo video that he showed you, this ties in very closely with this. The entire process is completely automated. There is no manual config uh, anytime. Now, I spoke about our near native integration with AWS and I'd like to quickly revisit our deployment topology. Uh, the WAS sit in between uh, the classic load balancer. We still use the elastic, but it's not a classic load balancer. We can sit in between any of the AWS native load balancers. We are we deploy in an AWS auto scaling group and take care of all applications behind us. Now the balancer of WAS has the AWS Security Competency Certification. And this is the Amazon uh, security architects telling you that we integrate very closely with their platform and solve three very specific things. A solution is pre-qualified by AWS, that it's well architected to leverage AWS features. And they looked at some very specific aspects. We work very well with the platform, we auto-scale and bootstrap, and we are completely automatable when it comes to deployments. Now, when our customers buy the WAF, uh, and this may answer some questions that have come up already, uh, the, they get a complete application security and delivery platform. The WAF itself delivers complete protection against web, mobile, and API-based application attacks. Uh, it covers the OWASP top 10 and more with both positive and negative security. Uh, it has something called adaptive profiling where it learns the application, figures out the limits, and uses them to block attacks. This is more than the signature-based security that most solutions talk about. Uh, it provides application layer DDoS protection and integrates with AAA to provide granular access. So if you remember, Rich demonstrated security testing as part of the automated deployment phase. Uh, he used Gauntlet. And at Barracuda, we provide you with a free service called the Vulnerability Remediation Service. Uh, this service allows you to easily test application security at every step of the development process. And every time it does a test, it builds its report to configure the WAF to block those vulnerabilities and pushes it automatically to the configured WAF. And now you just have to say, okay, apply, or no, I need to do this again. You can find vulnerabilities much earlier in your deployment chain, fix them much faster, and deploy configs automatically. Now, we've talked about a lot of technology stuff right now, and now I'd like to kind of take another look at what innovation means for the cloud. At Barracuda, we are laser focused on solving cloud problems. We know that DevOps folks want to move very fast. One of the most uh, friction prone areas is licensing. So when we were innovating, we realized that Technology innovations are not just enough. Licensing innovation, usage-based, is also good. Uh, is also something that the cloud needs. 
uh, Amazon came with their meter metered billing service, and we are the first and only VAF to integrate with it. Why metered billing? It takes away the friction of bringing your own license. You don't have to talk to a sales team, get a get a quote, go to your finance guys, get a budget approved, and then buy figure things out after that. You don't need to worry about per instance costs of pay as you go. Even when you go to pay as you go, you pay per instance per hour, which means that you may end up deploying a central VPC with security and uh, keeping it very far away from the application. Our metered billing allows you to pay per gig of data transfer across every single WAF you deploy. Whether you deploy 10 WAFs or 100 WAFs, there is only uh, there is only about per gig that is transferred across all these instances. You don't pay anything for each instance. Only the total data transfer is charged. We charge per gigabit. This takes pay as you go to the next level. It is real cloud-ready licensing. Uh, you know, like I said, you no longer have to centralize security, and you are much more cloud-ready than before. With that, I'd like to help you get cloud ready, set, and go. Uh, we have a web page with a lot of tutorials and videos that will help you get started with the WAF on AWS. We also have a hands-on lab that will help you figure out how to deploy the WAF, see how easy it is to deploy the Barracuda WAF on AWS and protect your web application. Uh, to help you even further, we provide you with a 90-day free trial where you can deploy the Barracuda WAF in your own environment and try it out. Now, at that, I'd like to close and hand over to Nick uh, for the Q&A. Cool. Thanks. So, uh, yeah, if you guys have questions about the, the WAF uh, security on AWS, uh, maybe what the deployment looks like, or sort of any, any of the questions around uh, common sort of customer scenarios, uh, put them in the chat. We'll, we'll start going through those. Uh, we've got a couple questions in already, so uh, to sure I think this is fun for you, but uh, what additional functionality does the very good WAF uh, provide over the AWS WAF that's native? So the native AWS WAF is a very nice WAF, but the Barracuda WAF is a complete application security and delivery solution. So some smaller things that the AWS WAF or other some seriously uh, important things that the AWS WAF doesn't provide natively, uh, like access control, where we integrate with uh, multiple AAA systems, uh, and similar other, the kind of logging and reporting that we provide uh, natively, are additional functionality that we provide over the AWS WAF. Okay, yeah, like what are some of the common customer use cases that you're seeing, uh, you know, that, they, that your WAF sort of Works well with. So we typically see a lot of customers who are moving on another cloud native. We're seeing significant numbers of cloud native customers, especially on AWS, who use the Barracuda WAF very closely next to their applications. Uh, we, they, they, we, they kind of see that we are very close to getting them to infrastructure as code, so they like to deploy us. Some of the more interesting use cases are people trying to protect uh, Elastic Beanstalk applications with the AWS WAF, uh, for protecting API gateway applications with the, uh, sorry, with the Barracuda WAF, and so on. Okay, cool. Uh, looks like we have another question here. Um, so how does the WAF interact with microservices? What's sort of, what does that look like? Uh, so at this point in time, we uh, sit in front of the classic load balancer and then talk to your microservices systems. Uh, we are looking at closer integrations with microservices environments, but at this time we don't have a full view of what that solution would be. But we do have customers who place us as a VM solution in front of their microservices architecture. The large financial customer who we spoke about just now is one of them. Uh, they just drop in one of the classic or application load balancers between the WAF cluster and the microservices for the load balancing. Okay, uh, another question here is, uh, does the WAF support proxy protocol? 
Yes, I believe this is for WebSocket, and we do. Okay. Yeah, for, for the rest of folks that are not familiar with proxy protocol, that's one of the options you can turn on the load balancer that will send sort of an initial uh, packet at the beginning of a TCP yep. session that uh, identifies yeah. important protocol, sort of as an alternative to uh, uh, exported for um, headers. Yes, we do. Um, we do support. Yes. Okay. Uh, so then the next one is, how does Barracuda integrate with on-premises SIM tools? Is there a list of supported SIM solutions? So we have a fully featured reporting and logging module where we uh, integrate with a lot of tools. So off the top of my head, I can remember QVedar, uh, Splunk, ELK, uh, and a whole bunch of other tools where we can send logs in very specific formats. That said, our logging and reporting module is very flexible. If you have a tool that requires a specific format uh, to send logs in, it is very easy for you to use our customization tools to send the logs in just the right format. As long as the tool can uh, receive logs over syslog, we can do it in any kind of uh, in any kind of uh, format that you require. All right, cool. All right, uh, folks, uh, if you have some more questions, send them in. Um, looks like we're getting to the majority of them so far. There was one question also. So um, the question was, uh, they said they've never used a LAP before. What's the easiest way to start deploying it? The easiest way to start deploying is to go to our pay-as-you-go page uh, on the AWS Marketplace. We will share the link at the end of the webinar. Uh, just deploy a single army. Uh, our WAF boots up very quickly. You can go to the web browser, type in the WAF's public IP address, colon 8000, log in, and you're ready to go. If you want to try the cloud formation template, it will even configure your web application behind it very easily. So uh, here I'd like to also talk about our cloud ready program, where we're providing a 90 day free trial direct from the marketplace. You don't need to go anywhere to to redeem it, uh, and we will send you a link to a lab that will help you get started with a WAF and a vulnerable application. Just deploy it and see how the WAF works. Okay, and, and, and here's one. Um, so they had a problem where the attacker used uh, to block a slash 16 subnet from some hosting provider on the internet, and they wanted to sort of rate control um, each IP address. The question is, uh, would the WAF be able to identify that these IP addresses are from a sort of cheap hosting provider and are in the same subnet and, and block that whole subnet range? So basically, can you aggregate uh, basically traffic patterns from maybe a known least uh, hosting provider and yeah. block that entire range? Yes, that is absolutely possible. Uh, so on the WAF, we have a fully featured IP reputation model that comes uh, as part of the base license. Uh, we actually don't charge for any features at the moment. And uh, so when that ha when you have the IP reputation module, we provide by default a whole set of blockable IPs. Uh, this could be country specific, this could be anonymous proxies, this could be uh, TOR or satellite IPs in case you don't want people with slow links trying your application and having a very bad uh, experience. Uh, and you can also get your own subnet ranges and configure the WAF to block these uh, block the IP. So it is completely possible for you to uh, control who accesses your uh, application based on the IP ranges that they're coming in from. Okay. And then uh, the other question is, uh, does, do you guys do anything around DDoS? Yes. We have a completely fully featured application DDoS module. Uh, so the WAF itself doesn't do much against volumetric DDoS because we sit behind an actual firewall or similar uh, similar so solution. But when it comes to something like a subtle application layer DDoS, something like a slow client attack or some slow read attack, then we can definitely stop those DDoS attacks. We evaluate clients, we figure out if they're the real deal or if they're trying to do an app DDoS attack, serve them with a capture or just cut them off directly without the capture, depending on how you want us to do it. All right, cool. Um, so there's another question here uh, about databases. 
do you guys do any sort of database security? So we don't directly uh, interact with databases for database security. Uh, that said, we protect any database that is behind the web application uh, against any kind of SQL injection attacks or any kind of injection attacks for that matter. Okay. Uh, let's see here. I think uh, I think that's what we've got sort of for questions. Um, I don't know, Rich or Tashar, is there any sort of uh, parting thoughts that you, you sort of want to leave people with? No, I mean, I think just that, you know, we move very quickly. We showed a lot of different aspects of web app security uh, and, and into the cloud. And, you know, just kind of as a recap as we got into all the weeds on this, uh, you know, the first foundation is you've got cloud providers who have that kind of baseline security. Uh, then we go ahead and we layer on top of that the, the ability to uh, manage your environments so that you can control that blast radius. So you really keep that down at both a, an account level, a network level, and an application component level. So you can distribute those things better and then use leverage the automation techniques we demonstrated to kind of move closer towards this immutable world uh, and including automation of inserting your security testing, inserting your security tools, and you're just all using the same process that everybody else uses. So um, I think that definitely is a, a really powerful combination, at least when you know I've been out there in the field working with people who do this. Uh, they end up, you know, getting some really, really good security advantages out of it. Okay. Right. Yes. Yeah, and with what Rich said, uh, a lot of what Rich said actually is being validated in the field, especially the part where the security is slowing down uh, DevOps. And we're seeing, a, we're doing a lot to break this mold, mold and move closer to infrastructure as a code. Uh, and yeah, and we are getting a lot of uh, traction in this. I'd like to, again, uh, reiterate that we have a free 90-day trial on the AWS Marketplace. We are cloud ready. Go ahead, try us out. If you need any help, you can reach us easily enough. Cool. All right, well, everyone, uh, thanks for joining. Um, appreciate the time. I understand a uh, busy day. Thanks for joining. Thanks, folks. Have a nice day. Thank you.